Good afternoon, everybody. This is Tony Freeman speaking. I'm in the London office of DTCC. And uh, hopefully there's a large community of you online who are joining us today. As of yesterday, there were 1,300 approximately people registered to attend this webinar. Um, we'll find out towards the end how many people actually connected up, but it should be a, a very high number. The UK, unsurprisingly, is the number one location for people joining this webinar today, but um, it is very global. For example, we have 106 registrations from India today, so I'd like to say hi to our clients and friends around the world. Thank you for joining us. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see a picture of me on the left-hand side with my two colleagues, and they're the people who really know what they're talking about. They're the people who are going to do um, the majority of the talking today. Uh, so as you can see, I'm Tony Freeman. I'm in the government relations team at DTCC in uh, London. Um, Rosie Slade, sitting next to me, is from the Wrexham office of DTCC, uh, and she works in the onboarding team. I won't read her biography out. You can, I know everybody can read. And Sam North is also based in London. He's in the uh, GTR product management area, and um, he has been dealing a lot with um, the Brexit project issues in the last couple of months. So, Rosie, Sam, say hi. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you. So let's move on to the agenda for the, uh, for the discussion this afternoon. Uh, as you will see, we do have a PowerPoint presentation, but this is very much an information sharing opportunity. We want to um, provide you with the opportunity to understand the process that's, uh, that we're going through because of the Brexit situation and give you the opportunity to ask questions. So the webinar is structured in four parts. Um, we're on part one right now, which is where we are and the, the big picture, the high-level overview of how Brexit is impacting us and our clients on a global basis. Sections two and three are where Sam and Rosie uh, get their chance to shine. That would be for about half an hour or so in the middle of the hour long time frame. And then we've allowed 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A section. And the, the questions will be submitted by you um, through the online portal. There, there won't be verbal questioning um, that was, is, is a little too difficult to manage in these circumstances. So please feel free to ent enter your questions through the uh, webinar software, and we'll do our very best to answer them. If we don't, we'll do our very best to get back to you after the webinar with a response to those questions. So please don't be shy. Um, the objective here is to overcome any misunderstandings and provide input to you. So. We're now on the first part of the presentation. I will talk for a few minutes about the, um, how DTCC and our clients are impacted by Brexit and how we are planning to respond. Um, DTCC is a multifaceted business, as I'm sure most of you will know. In the US, it's a very large clearing and settlement operation, uh, but also operates in the uh, area that we call GTR, uh, Global Trade Repository. Um, and we have various data businesses, and the area of the business that I come from historically, which is ITP, uh, formerly known as OMGEO, uh, Institutional Trade Processing, which is the middle office trade processing segment of the business. They're all impacted by uh, the Brexit project in, in different ways. Some are, some are very lightly affected, some are very di directly affected. Um, and the ITP business is the, is the area that's not directly affected. It's not, it's not in Europe. Uh, regulated in a formal way by the European supervisory authorities. Um, um, there is an environmental impact in that business in that many of the companies that are based in London are bifurcating their trading activity, activity between the UK and the European Union. Uh, so they're in a gradual process of opening up trading desks uh, and counterparties and legal facilities, etc., in the European Union if they're based in London. And it can also happen the other way around. If they're based in the European Union today, they can be opening um, facilities to want to do ongoing trading with their UK counterparties in the UK. Um, that's a business as usual exercise. There's no hard deadlines. Um, we are already seeing clients creating new bitcoins, new LEIs, um, and so forth, so that they are getting ready for that change to take place over the next few months. The GTR business is very much more directly impacted by the, um, the, the change in business because it's a much more formally regulated business. 
We'll move on to the next slide now. So the, the, the GTR, Global Trade Repository Business, is very directly impacted by the Brexit project. That's because it's regulated by ESMA. It performs trade reporting under the terms of the EMEA regulation um, to fulfill that regulation. And we are supervised by ESMA itself. They are our supervisor and regulator combined. Um, therefore, the change that's occurring to the GTR business is much more um, uh, is, is, a, is a much more abrupt change at the Brexit weekend, um, which is 29th of March next year, in case anybody didn't know that date. It's, I think it's kind of tattooed on all of us here as, count, as we count down towards it. Less than 200 days away, quite a lot less in terms of business days, if you think about the uh, weekends and, and Christmas holiday period that comes in between. And, and GTR is a large business for DTCC globally in, and in Europe. The uh, we have seven trade repositories on a global basis. Um, there are about 6,000 clients um, of that global GTR business, um, including 45 regulators. They're not really clients, but they're recipients of the data. So it's a very complex um, business that we're operating. And the volume of transactions and the activity in the GTR business is extremely high. Um, there are around 3,500 clients in Europe, um, 500 million messages per month. Um, and there are 42 regulators in the European Union who receive data from the GTR databases. So uh, the change is a complex one, and it will be happening um, over the Brexit weekend. There is a lot of work that can be done ahead of the Brexit weekend, but there will be some stuff that is done as of the 29th of March next year. Um, and Sam will be covering that in a lot more detail a bit later on in the, uh, in the discussion. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. What I should say before we cover the content of the next slide is that we are committed to providing a trade reporting service in both the EU and the UK post-Brexit. Um, nobody should assume that there will be a transition period or there will be any sort of delay. We are working to that 29th of March date as a hard Brexit, no deal scenario, um, which we weren't, but we are working on that basis and have been for quite some time. And we think everybody else should be doing the same thing. That, and is also the instruction from our regulators. Um, so we are committed to ongoing service. 29th of March is the date. Um, Post-Brexit, clients will be sending us the same messages in the same, to the same location using the, the same GTR infrastructure. There will be minimal changes taking place. Uh, and this is a very key point. I want to stress this point. We can't advise clients on what is reportable. It's up to clients to decide themselves what is reportable and, and who it's reportable to. Um, and if possible, and Sam will cover this in, in a good deal more detail a bit later, innovation should take place before the weekend leading up to the Brexit implementation if it's possible to do so. So as much preparation as possible is a good idea. So on slide six, you will see that there are, uh, on the left-hand side, there is one trade repository, which we call DDRL. Um, and on the right, there are two trade repositories, DDRL and DDRIE. DDRIE is the new trade repository that's been created in Ireland. It's already in existence, and it will be the trade repository used to report trades to ESMA for the EU reporting requirement under EMEA after the 29th of March next year. DDRL will uh, become a UK reporting entity. It will be reporting trades to the FCA um, from the 1st of April next year, which is the first working day of the uh, post-Brexit regime. Now, this, all this information has been provided to our clients in emails. It's available on our website. Um, Rosie's team, the onboarding team, and the relationship management team are available to answer questions on these, on these areas. So this isn't new information that's being provided here. This is a refresh of information that everybody should already have. Let's move on to the next slide. So what does the GTR business need to do? And, and there are five action items here on the, uh, listed on the, on the screen. Number one, establish new accounts for clients with the required trade repository. And this is it, Rosie's area of expertise, and we'll be coming onto that in a good deal more detail in a, in a minute. Um, impl implement the operational infrastructure for the UK trade repository. Um, that sounds fairly straightforward, but is a little bit more complicated than it would appear right now because the, we don't have the full regulation 
applying in the UK as yet. Um, but um, as we'll talk about in a minute, we have made an application to the FCA for UK trade repository status, and we're confident that that will be um, not, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, and actually, that's the next bullet point. Authorized by the ESMA and FCA, we have to go through an approval and authorization process. Um, we expect those to be completed by the end of the year. Uh, regulators don't do countdowns. They don't give you target dates for this type of activity, but uh, we are confident that we will complete the work, and they will complete their work in the necessary time frame. Um, we got to number four is we've got to move data to the correct trade repositories, and that's a Brexit weekend. That's a SAM subject uh, that we'll come onto in a lot more detail in a few minutes. Quite a complex area, and there's been a lot of client consultation taking place in that area. And then there's the new office logistics. The Dublin office for DDR IE is not a brass plate office. It's a real office with real people. It's not huge. Um, but it is real, and there is a regulatory requirement to have local management, local compliance, et cetera, et cetera, and it, for it to be a, uh, physically separated from a, in terms of data from other existing trade repositories. So where are we up to? Um, this is slide eight, Brexit project update. Um, the, as I said already, the DDR, i.e., a legal entity in Ireland has already been set up and the trade repository application has been made to ESMA. ESMA already regulates, and we are an approved trade repository right now, so that should not be problematic. Um, we're not doing a new, um, brand new application. Uh, there is a DocuSign process, which is an electronic process for novating contracts and creating new on onboarding entities. Rosie will cover that subject in a bit more detail. And we've looked at it, uh, uh, we've created an, a working group amongst our clients to look at the uh, the novation and position transfer situation, um, which Sam will be covering with. And uh, we know that we already comply with the FCA trade repository authorization process um, because, um, you know, we have uh, extensive informal contact with the policymakers and regulators in the UK. So the next slide is a timeline. Um, Everything is working towards the Brexit weekend of 29th of March next year, and you can see the milestones. So I won't go through them all in, in any great detail. Um, everybody can read those those timelines. Um, the key one that our GTR clients need to be aware of is the uh, September through November um, window, which Rosie will go into more detail about. And that's when we um, hope our, and expect our clients to actually go through the process of uh, looking at their legal entities and, and uh, doing doing the necessary work. What we want to do is avoid a last-minute rush. That this is the overall objective. We want this to be a carefully managed process, which we can cope with and our clients can cope with. Okay, we're moving on to the second and more, more meaty part of the presentation now. What do clients need to do and by when? Um, and I'm going to introduce you again to, to Rosie, who's going to cover the um, Novation subject in, a, in a quite a lot more detail than I've done it right now. So, Rosie, over to you. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, so, to start with, um, we're going to have a look at what the actual onboarding strategy is when it comes to uh, DDR, i.e. ESMA. So, um, for anybody who currently uses the ESMA service for GTR, you will have an existing user agreement in place with our DDRL entity, which currently offers the ESMA service. Post-Brexit, as you can see when Tony was going through his slides earlier, um, the ESMA reporting service will be um, provided by DDRIE, which is the new Irish entity. Okay, so there are a couple of parts to the onboarding um, process for Brexit. So firstly, we're going to look at the actual DocuSign Outreach, um, which is to sign up for a new user agreement with DDR, i.e. for ESMA reporting. Okay, so this DocuSign Outreach, um, it will have been Sorry, I think we just went on mute there yeah. for a moment for <laughs> some strange reason, so I don't know how much people missed, but uh, Rosie, carry on. I'll, yeah, I'll, um, I'll just start back, cover quickly what we missed there. Um, so the DocuSign process is the first part of the onboarding strategy for Brexit, and that is to open 
accounts that exist in DDRL ESMA today into DDRIE. So um, existing users of the ESMA service will have a DDRL user agreement, and the DocuSign outreach um, is to create a new user agreement in DDRIE. This outreach consists of two documents within it. There is a DDRIE user agreement, which is the user agreement for the ESMA reporting service going forward. And it also contains an information notice to DDRL. That information notice to DDRL allows DDRIE to reuse the data that has previously been provided to DDRL. So what this means from a client perspective is no new service request forms are required for those existing entities. We don't need any new authorizations to be completed again. We just need those two documents completed via the DocuSign for the existing accounts that are already open for DDRL today. There are going to be no changes to account IDs or O codes as part of the DocuSign process. So if you go in, complete those two agreements, all of your existing accounts that are onboarded for DDRL ESMA today will be activated for DDRIE ESMA post-Brexit with no changes to account IDs or O codes. That DocuSign also contains a checkbox for the position transfer process from DDRL to DDRIE, which Sam is going to talk about in a little bit more detail during his section. Okay. And the second part of the onboarding process um, is around adding new LEIs to the existing agreements that exist today. Um, we appreciate as part of Brexit, um, many clients are having to make changes on their side to create new legal entities or potentially some merger and Q&A 40 activity um, in order to support what you're doing on your side. So in order to, um, in order to do that, um, they will be onboarded as per the BAU onboarding process today. They can either be onboarded to DDRL or directly to DDRIE, depending on the requirements. So, and by depending on the requirements, I mean that if um, an entity needs to be uh, live and reported for prior to the actual Brexit date, then you would need to be sign up to add that entity to DDRL, because that's where ESMA reporting is uh, happening currently. However, obviously post-Brexit, it will switch to DDRIE. So the new LEI is being added. What effectively will happen is added by the BAU process. If you add them to DDRL today um, and complete the DocuSign, then that will mean that that entity is also activated for DDRIE reporting post-Brexit. Okay. Um, Q&A and 40 support for merger activity. Obviously, these are very specialized scenarios, which we can't talk about in great detail now. I think the thing to emphasize on this point is to please come to us as soon as possible with details of any mergers that are due to take place, um, and that way we can provide some more specialized response based on your particular scenario. Okay. And the final point of this slide here is the timeline. So you can see here the timeline where these changes need to take place. So the onboarding period opened on the 4th of September. Um, and the 30th of November is the required deadline for production and UAT access. So for clients requiring both production and UAT, uh, the onboarding part um, should be completed by this stage. Uh, for clients who only um, require production access, you have until the 28th of December to complete the DocuSign process and onboard any extra accounts. All right, thank you, Rosie. That was good. Um, could we see what the DocuSign process actually looks like, please. Of course. So on this slide, you can see on the right-hand side, um, it is quite small, but you can see this is a screenshot of the email that was sent out. Um, so you can see this is uh, DTCC branded. Um, it comes from GTR onboarding, um, and there's got a review documents button. That, doc that button there takes you through to the actual uh, documents itself. The email was sent from DocuSign directly, so you can see the email address here on the left-hand side. Um, that's the email address that the email will have come from. The subject line will be action required, Brexit onboarding, and then dash the email address of the recipient. So the, um, the recipients, so we sent to the two most recently logged in SuperAxis coordinators. For many firms, that will be probably your only super access coordinators, but if there are a, a, a number, we wanted to try and reach the most active, 
Um, so we've reached out to the team most recently logged in. Um, DocuSign means that electronic signatures, we don't need to have paper copies of these documentation, uh, this documentation provided. So um, once that's completed and the DocuSign workflow, everybody gets a PDF copy of the final completed agreement with the electronic signatures. Um, that comes to us directly and back to yourselves. Um, so we have a record of that agreement being signed. Um, and additionally, we understand that for a number of clients, for um, internal procedures, et cetera, require two signatories to sign the agreement. Um, where two signatories are needed, then um, we can support that. However, you do need to come to GTR onboarding to action that before signing the agreement. So if you come to GTR onboarding, um, one of our dedicated team will help you and um, resend the agreement to the two signatories who are required. Okay. Um, there's also a DocuSign FAQ available on our website for kind of frequently asked questions around DocuSign. Um, so please, uh, please take a look at that. Failing that, the onboarding team will be able to help with any further issues that are, um, that are found. Rosie, is that uh, website address easy to find? Yes, so that's dtcc.com slash Brexit. Great, that sounds okay. easy enough. Okay. Okay. Are we moving on? Yes, we move on. Okay, so uh, the next point, the next slide I think is key, labeled key points. What are the key takeaways that we want to stress to our clients here? Sure. Okay, so I think the key points for our clients to remember um, relate to First, we've got what to do with the existing accounts and then new legal entities. So for existing accounts, um, to, for ESMA reporting post-Brexit, you need to be onboarded to DDR IE. That's by the document process that we've just had a look at now. Um, if you don't require FCA reporting, then you can give notice to terminate your DDRL agreement, um, which will take place as of the change of the authorization from DDRL to DDR IE. So that's if you don't need FCA reporting going forward, um, please let the onboarding team know and we will send you a DocuSign process will, um, to um, provide that notice. So FCA reporting, so for our uh, clients who want, require reporting to UK FCA going forward, um, we need to be onboarded to DDRL. Um, to, and to be onboarded to DDRL, well currently you already have a DDRL user agreement as this is what ESMA leverage is today. So since you already have an agreement, um, there is no further action to be taken to be activated for FCA reporting. If we don't hear otherwise, then we will activate everybody to be able to use FCA reporting going forward post-Brexit. Okay. Um, to be onboarded to both, obviously, we'll leave FCA will be automatically activated and then complete the DocuSign in order to onboard for DDR, IE, ESMA. Okay. Um, and in regards to new accounts, as we discussed before, I think the important takeaway there is to um, add the entities that are required, so any new LEIs that have come online, um, mergers, et cetera, contact us about both, um, and complete the DocuSign process. That will cover all of your accounts, including any that are onboarded after the date that the DocuSign is signed. Okay. There's a decision tree available on the dtcc.com slash Brexit website, which takes a look at which repository you need to be onboarded to um, based on where the reporting, um, your reporting obligation lies. So I'd recommend to have a look at that as it's a good visual representation. And we also have an onboarding FAQ available on the website um, where you can find some further information around the onboarding process as well as the dedicated Brexit, um, Brexit DocuSign FAQ. Good. Thank you, Rosie. Um, you can take a breather. Um, we are getting quite a number of questions coming in, so we're going to try and talk and line up which questions we can answer um, in, in, while um, Sam is talking. Um, and I want to remind everybody that this uh, webinar is being recorded, um, so I, I can metaphorically hear people's pens scratching away trying to write down everything that's been said. Um, you will get a chance to, to re-listen to, uh, to this webinar. Um, and that will be available from, hopefully, I think early next week. So it won't be too long before we can make that recording available. Okay, so we're going to now hand over to Sam. Um, Sam is right in the weeds of technical details about how the position transfer issue was taking place, had a lot of consultations with our clients. And I know he's already looking forward to spending the weekend sleeping under his desk uh, the weekend of the 29th of March next year, 
Oh, it, well, he's probably not going to go home for about 72 hours, I, I would guess. I'm giving you a fair warning here, Sam. So, Sam, over to you. Tell us about the, the activities that are going to take place regarding position transfer, particularly over the Brexit weekend. Sure, Tony. No problem. Um, it is certainly going to be a busy weekend um, come the end of March. Um, so what you're looking at on your screen is a very high-level diagram of essentially where we stand today and where we want to be um, post-Brexit. You'll notice the legal entities along the top of the diagram and the various data stores within the boxes on the diagram. Um, how do we get to that future state? Well, there's a number of activities that need to take place. Um, firstly, um, DDCC is going to migrate all trade data from the DDRL entity into the DDRIE entity. Um, DDRL will cease to be an EMEA TR post Brexit, so all data will be migrated to the new entity. Um, this includes all historical data, expired mature trades, um, the entire data set will be under the DDRIE entity. Um, to drive this migration, we will obviously need an instruction from clients. So that will be the DocuSign that uh, Rosie outlined previously. That has already been sent to you, so you should have that already, um, which will need to be completed um, for us to do that migration. Um, secondly, DCC is going to identify FCA reportable trades through the domicile of the counterparty LEI. Um, so we will look at the counterparty LEI and validate that against the Glyph database. The specific field we'll use in the Glyph database is the legal address country field. Um, and we will identify anything that will become FCA reportable using this logic um, via the Glyph database. Once we have identified those um, open trades, we will copy all open FCA reportable trades uh, back to the DDRIE entity. Um, a couple of points, key points with this is that the FCA have advised us that they only want open positions. No historical data will be in the DDRL FCA trade repository, only open trades. Um, and the other key point is that this is not a migration, so to speak, it's more of a copy. So we will copy these trades over to the FCA TR, um, but we will take no action in removing these from DDRIE. Um, Post-Brexit weekend, it will be the client's responsibility to um, essentially reconcile the, the, the trades if, if you have trades in both TRs, uh, is to reconcile that data uh, and then take any remedial action um, if required. Thank you, Sam. Very clear. Uh, but I'm sure you're going to get questions um, which we'll try and deal with. I think we're actually a little bit ahead of time, which is good, because we are getting quite a lot of questions coming in. So um, we want to give time to answer those. So um, you've got another slide here. It's got quite a long list of uh, items on here. What are the other critical items that people need to, uh, to consider here? Yeah, sure. So um, just for some, some context, I suppose, around the project delivery. So we are looking to deliver the Brexit project using an agile methodology. We will have two weeks sprints starting from the middle of October. Uh, we feel this is the right methodology to drive up the quality of code. Um, in terms of critical items that we see, uh, the, the two main items that jump out are the data migration, um, is going to be critical and the onboarding exercise, which more sits with clients than, uh, than DCC. So we need to ensure you are onboarded to the correct TR um, and also that the data is in the right place. Um, next up around the submission methods. Um, so we're trying to make this as simple as possible for clients. So firstly, submission methods will remain the same. We will have uh, SFTP. MQ connectivity available, um, and obviously the web portal as well. Um, in terms of the physical connectivity, this will remain the same for both TRs, so you will connect to the same IP addresses, same ports, for example. Um, in terms of the message templates, 
uh, these will remain, re remain the same and all will, will be available. Uh, the only change to these templates is the um, reporting destination field, which will support an additional value of FCA, um, and you will use this to designate the correct TR. Um, some of the, the activities and UAT recommendations. So um, obviously, onboarding activities, I highly recommend that you complete any onboarding activity well ahead of time. We don't want a last minute rush. Um, from a UAT perspective, I, I don't see that you will need to do huge amounts of testing at a field level on your submissions. Um, there are no, there's going to be no changes to the validation rules at um, the point of ingestion. These rules won't be changing other than the reporting destination. Um, so in terms of testing, I would say there's more around the eligibility of where you need to report that trade. Um, and obviously the routing on our side as well, how we route that trade to the correct TR based upon the reporting destination. Um, reconciliation is always a hot topic with EMEA reporting. Um, just some key points that I would like to point out. There's going to be no uh, reconciliation between the TRs, so there won't be a rec between FCA and EMEA reportable trades. Uh, we will have two separate reconciliations running independently in each trade repository. Um, anything that is reported cross-jurisdictionally will be considered single-sided um, and exempt from the reconciliation. Um, in terms of additional services, um, all the additional services that we offer today um, will obviously be made available um, for FCA reporting, so that includes the CRD and CRDE, um, and obviously the global portal as well. Um, in terms of the grace period, um, it, it's something that we are going to be discussing with authority. So whilst no regulator will agree to something as explicit as a grace period, uh, we'll, we will be discussing it with uh, both ESMA and the FCA a period post-Brexit where clients can complete relevant reconciliation and, uh, and remediation activities. Um, in terms of billing, another hot topic for clients, um, under EMEA rules, trade repositories are unable to bundle services together, so we will be producing two invoices at the entity level, both DDRL and DDRIE will be producing invoices. Um, in terms of the fees, these will remain the same across both trade repositories. Um, we are looking to publish our fee schedules in the next couple of weeks, so look out for that. Um, and then finally, just some, some milestones to look out for. The functional change document um, is being drafted at the moment and will be published to the Learning Center in the next couple of weeks. This will go into a lot more detail on what you will need to do um, from a technical perspective to be ready to report to both TRs if required. Um, and finally, look out for more webinars to come because we will be going into a lot more detail in the upcoming webinars. Yeah, this is not a one-off, is it? We expect to do one in, at least in October and November to follow up and we're up to 59 questions so we can't possibly answer all of those so uh, I think there is clearly a demand for more opportunity to, to do Q&A so Sam I'll give you a chance to have a quick breather and I'll ask Rosie a quick question which has uh, come in from a client called Victoria um, it's about Hong Kong, Hong Kong Monetary Authority uses DDRL for its reporting right now. So can you explain how that's affected and what will be done there? Yeah, sure. So for the Hong Kong um, Connectivity Service, there's no change required there. It will continue to leverage the DDRL contract. So if you currently utilize that service and wish to continue to do so in the future, you don't have to take any action. Um, that will be uh, staying exactly the same as it is today. Got it. Nice and clear. Thank you. Um, Sam, I've, I've been juggling while you were talking, and I've got four questions lined up for you if you don't mind. Sorry to throw these curveballs at you. Um, a client called Khalid has asked a question, can clients use the same UTI across the two TRs, trade repositories? Uh, yep, the short answer uh, is yes. Um, technically, yes, 
we can support this, yeah. Okay, um, another question from a client called Carla. Um, data migrations can be complex, you're telling me. Um, what is DTCC doing to mitigate the risk involved in this process? Yeah, sure, uh, I very much agree. I would say, firstly, as a data migration, we look at this as a fairly simple one. The logic for identifying the applicable trades is obviously a, a fairly simple logic in that we are using the domicile of the LEI. Um, secondly, the data model is the same across the TRs, so the Essentially, the reportable fields are exactly the same, so it's, it is essentially a copy and paste. Um, and finally, I'd say we are going to be looking to do a dry run of this data copy um, early next year, which um, will help iron out any issues if there are any. Got it, Sam. Thank you. A couple more for you. Uh, sorry to bombard you. Um, from a client called Marco. Will DTCC be making any changes to the data during the migrations? I think this is a fairly short answer, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. We will absolutely not be touching the data and updating it in any way right. during the migrations. Got it. Okay, and the last question I've picked out for, and right now, because there are a lot more um, on the webinar portal, um, when copying, and this is from Leticia, when copying FCA reportable trades to DDRL, Will this include historical data such as mature trades? Uh, I think you no, covered that earlier, didn't you? I did cover it. I did touch on it, but I can expand on that. So the FCA have explicitly advised us they do not want any historical data. They only want open trades in their trade repository. So no, we will not touch any historical data. Um, to, to expand on that, we won't be doing any validations of this. Um, data copy either, so we won't, as we migrate trades to the FCATR, we won't be validating it as per the latest um, technical standards released by ESMA. This will be a straight copy. Got it. Okay, thank you. I'll give you a breather. I'm going to ask Rosie a quick question, which is coming from a client um, called Sophie. Uh, to whom will be sent the DocuSign? So who did we send the information about the DocuSign process to? So the DocuSign itself was sent to the Super Access coordinators. Um, where, there, where you have more than two Super ACs, uh, we sent the DocuSign to the two who had most recently logged into the GTR system. Um, so recommend that you get in touch with your Super Access coordinators and see if they've received the DocuSign. They may also want to check their spam folders since it doesn't come from a DTCC email address. It comes directly from DocuSign itself, so it might possibly have gone in there. Um, failing that, if you can't locate it and you're concerned no one from your firm has received the DocuSign, please come into GTR-onboarding and one of our onboarding team will be able to resend a copy to the required contact. Right. So I have a couple of follow-ups which you may already have covered. If, if the super user access has changed, how do we notify you? Um, yep. So if the super ACs have changed um, and the ones that we have on file are no longer relevant, um, if you have more super users, they can make those changes themselves. Um, if you don't, then you'll need to come to the onboarding team and we'll, um, we'll be able to help you make those changes from our side. So please let the onboarding team know. Right. Okay. And a client called Michael has said, I am the SAC for his company. I received no email. So you think that's probably because it's in a spam folder? Yeah, I think um, it most likely is because it's been sent to a spam folder since it doesn't come from us. So check in there. If you still don't think you've received it, then come to onboarding and we'll be able to resend a, a copy to you. They're friendly people, aren't they? Yes, like, they're in, very friendly people. Rexham. They'll be very happy to help. Yes, happy to help. Good. Okay. Um, there's a question here. I'm not sure I fully understand the, the question, actually. re enter some trades. Uh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, I'm, I'm asking the wrong question. Uh, the DDRIE portal, um, hold on a minute, I'm sorry, I've lost it, it's jumping around. The DDRIE portal will be different if O codes are going to be used. Um, Sam, are you able to answer that question, or is that, is that something we need to get back to people afterwards about? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that question. Okay. I think the O codes will stay the same. 
Um, so the technology the interface will stay the same. Yeah, and the O-code itself will stay the same. So you won't be giving a different O-code for DDRA in right. reporting. So, but the essential change is that clients will have to specify whether trades go to the FCA or to ESMA, or in some circumstances, both, actually. Right? Yeah, that's correct. That's, that's what we've been told by our clients. Okay. All right. Um, I had a question about the position transfer process, but I think you've covered that, Sam. I think that question probably came in earlier. Um, are DTCC going to publish eligibility rules for reporting to F FCA? And if so, what will the location URL be? So my understanding is the URLs will be the same. Is that correct, Sam? Absolutely. You're nodding at me. Good. Yeah. The, um, um, the portal will remain the same. The portal will remain the same, but it's not its not our job to publish the FCA r rules. It's the FCA's job to publish the FCA rules, as, as I understand it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, one of the key points that we uh, need to stress is that the DTCC cannot determine the reporting obligation on your behalf. Um, that's one of the key points. As a trade repository, we can't give advice on your reporting obligation. No, we're not able to. It's not, not allowed, and it wouldn't be sensible even if we were allowed to do so, I think. We, clients are all different in small ways, and their reporting obligations are personal to them. So, okay, let's uh, go up the list to the next question. Um, Will you be distributing the slides or we need to watch the webinar again? We're not going to be distributing the PowerPoint presentation itself. It's designed for this webinar in particular. But as I mentioned earlier, there will be a recording of the webinar available. Um, next question so from a client called Joe. Will DDRL and DDRI reporting utilize the same schema and reporting channel? So I think we've answered that question. That's a yes. That is a yes. Simple. We want to keep it as simple as possible, don't we, particularly with the, in the time frames available. Um, will uh, this may be something you discussed with the clients in their position transfer advisory group, Sam. Will clients, sorry, will DTCC organize a dress rehearsal with firms before the Brexit go live? Yes. So um, I did touch on that earlier. We are looking to do a dry run of the Brexit weekend in either February or March. Um, and that will include the data copy and migration, um, and we'll look to generate some reports for clients to view what it would look like post-Brexit. So yes, we are looking to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question in from a client called Ian. Uh, I'll read it out. In the event under, quote, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, which is the uh, very well-known phrase used by the European Union, um, if there is not complete agreement um, by 31st of the 3rd, 19, what then? Well, we are working towards that scenario. That's been our long-held assumption that for business planning purposes and also because we were told to by regulators, uh, we are working towards a hard Brexit scenario. Um, so there will be two separate trade repositories. There will not be a transition period. Um, regulatory forbearance is hoped for but never officially given, um, particularly when there's such a large amount of work to be done in such a short space of time over that weekend itself. Uh, the other related question, and this may be in the list of questions that I haven't got to yet, is what happens if there is a transition period agreed um, at some point? Um, again, this is not something that we can take into our planning considerations. It's uh, on, the, on the basis that the track record of negotiations with the European Union is that they normally do deals. I say normally, almost always do deals, um, but they're very often done at the last minute. Um, so we can't change our plan, and we don't think our clients can change plans two or three days before Brexit Day on the basis that peace and love breaks out between the EU and the UK, and a formal transition period is, is agreed. So we're not working on that basis, and we don't think anybody else should work on that basis. Uh, so maybe there's a, a question further up the list on that subject, and we can talk about more about it. Um, Sam, you wanted to say something? I did, yes. I've just seen a question, uh, which is a good one, and will provide some clarity. So um, a question from me here that says, will there be a separate FCA position report? Um, the answer is, you, you will get a separate report, but it will be exactly the same format as the 
fishing report you received for EMEA today. Um, but it um, it will be generated separately, um, and that um, will be the same across our entire reporting suite for EMEA. We will make every report available for FCA reporting. Good. Okay. Um, do tell me if there's anything else you pick out from the list of questions, but I've got one here that um, um, I'd like to put to you. I'm not sure which one of you is the um, the right, maybe maybe you, Sam. Why do FC, this is from a client called Dylan. Why do FCA positions need to be in the DDR, i.e. post-Brexit? Is there um, a misunderstanding there? No, they don't. So, uh, as uh, the way our conversations with ESMA are going um, is that they don't want us to remove anything from their trade repository. Um, anything that's already there? Anything that's already there. Right. Um, we, the, the conversations are ongoing, um, but that is the, the guidance that we've had thus far. Okay. There's one here from, uh, sounds like somebody in Switzerland or Germany. Is it known if FCA will come up with its own FPML schema and their own set of validation rules? I think at this point the answer is definitely not. <laughs> not for the go live weekend or not for the Brexit weekend. Um, potentially there is um, the prospect of some divergence between the two authorities, um, but for the Brexit weekend they will be identical. Right. For the foreseeable future, they will be identical. Yeah. We've heard nothing contrary. No. But the expectation, I think, of everybody is that there will be some divergence at some point in the future. Correct. Yes. Um, I've seen a couple of questions around the um, who can actually sign the DocuSign from the yeah. onboarding point of view. Right. Um, so in terms of who can sign the DocuSign, um, that is completely up to you from a client perspective. It should be somebody who is authorized to enter into a contract from your behalf. You probably have company procedures, etc., which state which individuals are authorized to sign for your company. It does not have to be the SAC who has received the DocuSign agreement. So they can really easily go into the DocuSign and reassign it. Um, it takes about three steps in order to do that um, to the email address of the person who actually has the authorization to do so. So it should be somebody authorized, um, and you can reassign it very easily to that person. Thank you, Rosie. Good. Uh, another question from a client called Steve. What do we need to do on the client side for destination fields? So this is where the client is specifying which trade repository to report the trade to, correct? Yep. So at, at the moment, um, you would be populating ESMA in the reporting destination field. Because that's the only place. If you're, yep, for EMEA reporting. For EMEA reporting, yes. Yep. And post-Brexit, we will also support the value of FCA. Uh, and that is how you will designate a trade that needs to be in the FCA TR. Right. So there's a new value that's applicable in that field, but it's not a new data field itself. Correct. Same field, uh, additional value. Right. And this is something that already exists in other parts of the world, isn't it? It's not entirely new functionality. No, it's, it's supported today for a mere reporting. Yes. Um, and uh, we have the same functionality across all of our right. TRs. Yeah. Okay. So it was built in that there could always be multiple destinations yeah. for the data. Okay. All right, good. We're getting through these, but there are a lot of questions, uh, so I think we will have to do some of them afterwards. Um, question here from, uh, please excuse my pronunciation, Vijendra. Um, will we be able to see the trade state reports of both FCA and EMEA under one DTCC portal? Uh, you, you, we won't be able to co-mingle data, but it will be within the same place. Yes. Um, we are unable to co-mingle data across reporting regimes. Right. They're separate trade repositories. Yes. Yes. That's the key point, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Kathleen has asked the question, will you perform pairing and matching across TRs, i.e. UK and Irish? Um, good question. And no, we will not. There will be no reconciliation across the TRs. Um, if there is a, an EU 27 counterparty facing a, a UK counterparty, they will each side of that trade will be in each TR. Um, but in each TR, they will be classed as single-sided 
and exempt from the reconciliation. Okay, thank you. Good. Sorry to bombard you, but I think I've got another one for you. Then we, maybe you will switch over to Rosie again in a moment. Um, Charles has asked, what is the impact of the switch from DDRL to DDR, i.e. on the SWIFT connectivity? Is the short answer none at all? There is none. No activity. No um, impact to SWIFT. Right. Connectivity remains the same. We're trying to keep this simple, aren't we? It's fearsomely yeah. complicated enough already. So, um, no, we don't, we don't want to, any other changes. Okay, so... Um, Michelle, or McKaylee, um, pardon my pronunciation maybe, is if we are currently reporting to the GTR through DTCC, is there anything we need to do as a uh, result of this change? Well, I think that's the whole point of this webinar. We've covered, it, it is absolutely mandatory, we believe, for all clients to look at their reporting obligations post-Brexit. Um, we, we have heard from some clients that um, they believe this is somebody else's problem. That's, that's not the words they use, but that's the kind of meaning that uh, they re here in that they will be told what to do. Uh, this is somewhat prevalent, certainly not across the board, but some buy-side firms think, well, our brokers and custodians will take care of this issue for us and they'll tell us what they need to do. Um, everybody's reporting obligations are their own reporting obligations and everybody needs to decide on their own reporting obligations. So we believe all our clients need to look at this and they, they may end up not doing anything. It's, that's perfectly feasible. That there, there will be no activity required. Um, but I think at the, the minimum, we're expecting uh, a good number of our clients, possibly the majority of our clients, to have to do the onboarding to the DDR, i.e. legal entity. Is that, would, is that correct, Rosie? Yeah, I think, that's, um, I think that's correct. And we've had about a 20% response rate already on the DocuSign that we've sent out. Which is not bad. Yes, not given bad. Given that it's, what, we're three weeks into the process? Exactly, yeah, three weeks. Three weeks out of three months is, is not too bad if we've got no. 20%. But we want to get that figure up as high as possible in the September, October, November time frame uh, to make it a manageable process for everybody. Okay. Um, yes, Sam, you've identified another question. <coughs> yeah, just to, just to reiterate, so there was, I've seen a lot of questions around when we're going to be publishing specifications, um, message specs and um, functional specifications. So in terms of the message specifications, the, they will remain the same with the exception of the reporting destination field. So if you are starting to look at any impact, you can use the existing EMEA specs. Um, we will be updating these in the coming weeks with the um, reporting destination field updated. Um, and the functional change document will also be published in the coming weeks as well. So right. look out for those. Okay. Um, I had a question which I think we've probably already answered, but let me reiterate it from a uh, Japanese bank. When will you provide submission template? We've already got the submission template, right? Yeah, they remain the same. It's existing templates. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, there might be an impact on partners who provide this interface for some of our clients, possibly, that they will have to change the destination field values, potentially. Yep. But that's the only technical change that we foresee. Exactly. Good. Okay. Glad I understand it. Glad you're here, though. Um, okay, so uh, let me just... Rosie, you got yeah, one more? I yeah, I think one that um, I, I'd like to answer. So um, Dylan has asked around, if we complete the DocuSign, will our non-UK domiciled entities automatically be switched over to DDRE? Um, we don't need to specify this on our onboarding form. Um, so that's correct, Dylan. Um, if you sign the DocuSign, then all of your entities that are currently onboarded for ESMA reporting today will be switched to DDR IE. So they will all have the access to report into DDR IE ESMA. You don't need to specify these on any of the onboarding forms that you may usually provide. Got it. Okay. And I've seen another question which I think might be related from Abdul. Um, we report for EMEA via a third-party vendor, which is mentioned here, but I won't mention their name, and onwards to DTCC. So how does this, um, how is this affected where clients are using third parties? Okay. So, see, so your third-party um, vendor will be dealing with us directly around kind of their side of things. From your perspective, um, if you're the report submitter, then you need to be onboarded to the correct repository. But also, if you want to see the reports, you have to be onboarded to the correct repository. So 
Um, you may not be reporting into DDRIE directly yourself. However, you will still need to be onboarded to DDRIE to actually have visibility of the reports that are produced. Got it. Okay. Um, Sam, I think I might have a question for you here on LEIs, because you, you mentioned the GLIFE yep. earlier. So if you've seen this question, counterparty LEIs often expire or lapse. Well, they do expire every year, is my understanding. That's a part of the process. Um, how GLIFE database will handle efficiently? So how, will we, how do we keep that up to that information fresh? So we have a, uh, a feed that is more or less real time from GLIFE that we check. So, um, so we're not using stale information? No. No. Very much so. It's, it's uh, a live feed. Yeah. Right. I think we are the biggest contributor of LEIs to the GLIFE database, so it would be natural for us to be properly up to date. Okay, so another point on LEIs is that the validation rule that we have in place for EMEA in that the LEI needs to be in a valid status uh, will continue for FCA reporting as well. Got it. Okay. All right. So we're coming up to we're two minutes before the hour, and I said this webinar would last an hour. I think we've got through a lot of stuff, but we haven't answered all the questions, but I'll ask you one more LEI thing, as I think it's related, Sam, if that's all right. Uh, this is from Amy. Hi, Amy. Um, whose LEI is used to determine the reporting domicile, the reporting firm's LEI? So it will be the entity with the reporting obligation. Um, so um, the uh, counterparty one much of the time. Got it. Okay. okay. All right, so um, I think we could go on and on answering questions here because they're still coming in. Um, we've answered quite a few, but I don't think we're going to be getting through the remainder of these questions. So I will call it a day at that point. Um, and r remind everybody, that please use the resources available that have been outlined as email addresses. There are websites. There is Rosie's extremely friendly team in Wrexham um, to answer onboarding questions, DocuSign questions. And clearly, this is a subject that is receiving widespread attention from our clients, which I'm very pleased about. That's exactly what we wanted to happen, um, and that we will need to do more of these discussions to allow people to ask more questions. So um, an hour, doing this for an hour is, is a lot of information, complex subject. You can only do so much, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I'll say thank you very much to uh, Sarah for organizing us today. Thank you, Rosie and Sam, for speaking so knowledgeably. Well done. Good job. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for dialing in and participating in the webinar. And we'll be in touch with uh, details of further information as it becomes available. Thank you very much, and bye-bye.